largely through trial and error is in fact road design and then mitigating legacy roads that have landslide potential. And like I say, that's predominantly from trial and error, lots of error. Okay, so one of the watersheds I spent 25 years working in, Ryanair has recently sold this ground, had extensive railroad and truck harvest in the 30s and 40s. We purchased it from Bloedel. 1951, the very famous Forks fire made it across the divide into this watershed, out of the old growth into slash. Easterly wind came up and this thing ran 30 miles in 13 hours and burned a quarter of the town of Forks. Uh, we did salvage logging along the margins because as it crept up around the watershed edges, it was into old growth timber and then we just walked away for a long time. So this is a 1953 aerial photography when we would have been doing the salvage logging. You can see a lot of bare ground. You can see some pretty big road landslides uh, right there big one up here not huge not huge events those actually happened later when there was more loss of rooting strength 2003 aerial photographer pho photograph of the same area and you don't see a road to drive on do you for the first time i went in this watershed i had a 30 mile day clinging to somebody's back on an atv and that was it was really just the people that used atvs out in the woods that provided any access into this watershed so kind of a weird situation for the timber industry in western washington to have ground this isolated this much hiking in to do anything um Fill slope failures, because we've thrown material over the side in steep ground, are an absolutely chronic problem. Uh, they sort of range from small slumps. So these will occur on moderate kinds of ground. I saw a number of these in, where would I have been with Drew? Kind of Bay of Plenty area maybe? Yeah, Plenty, yeah. yeah they, they had a bunch of this, right? I mean, the soils are really different, the vegetation's really different, and yet I saw a bunch of these little slumps, which are because you have side cast and then you have a water management problem. Um, you get into steeper ground, you can lose half, two thirds of your road prism and it creates a big debris flow trucking down the hill. So if you just start with a 70% planar hill slope, and this is kind of where landslides start to initiate naturally, and this is where I start to fuss about things. And if you want, and I'm sorry about the whole metric unit things, but, but 14 feet is gonna be three and a half meters maybe. If you want to, 14 foot full bench road to drive on and we do in this kind of country create a big enough cut to have a driving surface that is on the native ground. You create about 14 cubic yards per lineal yard. Yards very close to a meter so just translate that into meters in your mind. 14 cubic meters of material here you throw it over the side and that's per lineal meter of road. It's a lot of material, right? This might be a good place to, to stop and talk about that for a minute. So when your natural hill slope is really steep and you put that cut in and you throw the crap over the side, it doesn't just tend to sit there, even, even from the get-go with construction, all right? You're doing this in the dry weather. If you've got a 90% hill slope, then you're in some kind of competent lithology. You're breaking rock out of that cut slope. It screes down a long ways. And it's not all up here where you can reach it. And then as the decades go by, areas along here will fail and cause a landslide and go down the hill. 
So the reality is, is that when you're doing side cast pullback, removing the excess material in really steep ground, there probably isn't a lot left to pick up. And typically I'm thinking light pullback, one to two cubic yards per lineal yard. That's pretty light. If you were in gentler ground to begin with, does that look gentler? Okay. Then you probably have that whole wedge perched here. And typically pull, so this is one to two yards cubed per yard. Think meters. This one here will be more like four to six yards cubed per yard. Now, how do I know this? I know this because after looking at a whole bunch of situations on roads and discovering that road inch will not put this side cast pullback process into the mass hall, right? You drop your road grade, you'll see this today, but if you drop your road grade and then you daylight out, no berm on the outside of the road, and you end haul all of that, road inch understands about all of this. And sometimes if we do need to drop our road grade, that's how we accomplish side cast pullback without explicitly asking for it. But I, I assure you that the engineers have to, you know, do a lot of fast talking to get me to agree to this. Um, but if you're just rebuilding this road at its original grade location, you have to add this into your mass hall to put together your, con you know, it's like say your road contract because road inch can't handle it. And so I finally drew little diagrams that were sort of averages of what I was seeing on the landscape and, that, and, and then literally just like counted the little boxes. I do a lot of that. I get graph paper, I diagram things one to one and I count the little boxes. It's real sophisticated. But that's where these values come from. I'm going to lose your pin if I don't keep track of it. So that's sort of good news, bad news. Um, you do less pullback in really steep ground because there isn't much left. Really uh, moderate ground, you have heavier quantities. Depending on where it is, though, you may have shorter pieces of road that need this kind of attention. Okay, so full benched means that the drivable tread is fully cut into the hill slope does not imply that end haul of side cast occurred. It can still be a, a whole, whole nother piece of road on the outside, all the crap we threw over. And, and this is a, a long point of contention between me and my engineers, particularly in the early years. And so I actually got this kind of information embedded into our forest practices rules when we rewrote the rules because I was tired of having the arguments. If it weighs something, it is side cast because this is basic, simple physics. And I have had multiple engineers, multiple tree farms. I don't think that enormous log deck caused that landslide. That log deck was out on junk on the edge, right? Soft, uncompacted soil and stuff from the first road building process. And then they went and parked a 14-ton log deck out on the edge. And, oh gosh, I don't think that had anything to do with the landslide. Come on, people. It's basic Newtonian physics. If it has weight, big list of stuff weighs something, it's sidecast. Does the log digs maybe rise as well? So I've, I've just uploaded Julie's um, presentation as PDF, so if you did want to uh, jump and learn and, and follow her through on, on the PDF version, it's just up on the page now. So the word perched means that your side cast edge is steeper than the, the natural ground in front of it, and this is very often the case, particularly in this situation, right? that you've got this steep edge and then you go back to gentler natural ground. And it is not super common to see this, but you see this little subtle black line there? OK, 
Okay. So my dear friend Megan Tuttle, you see this black line? What is that? That's the fill line because that black line is the original humus soil layer, right? And sometimes after the landslide happens, you get to see, you know, exactly how much fill you had on the site and what the native slope looked like before you shoved the fill over the side. And then you see that this slope is fundamentally steeper than this slope. So that's this perching effect. That's all the gravity vector, right? Gravity can be divided into a horizontal vector and a vertical vector. And the, ver and the steeper the ground, the bigger the component, the vertical component, right? That's why landslides happen fundamentally. Repeat after me, Newtonian physics. Okay, so end haul fundamentally means that the cut material is placed in a truck and moved to a designated waste area. Overhaul means that the cut material is pushed some distance, and that's usually less than about 100 meters. Um, you berm the outside edge of the road, you start cutting in your road width, pushing into the cut slope, and you just keep pushing with the dozer. This only works when you're in kind of moderate ground and somewhere there's a place to put this material that's safe. And I will warn you that you know, sort of the earliest iterations of side cast pullback done in Washington State were done by the U.S. Forest Service. And they did some really nice projects. What they left behind looked fabulous. And then you went to the waste area and said, what the heck were you doing? That was not the right place to put waste. So waste areas need to be carefully picked and they need to be carefully managed. We actually flag the outside edge in blue flagging. That's the <coughs> limit. I specify a depth, and then we calculate a volume. That's a 5,000 cubic yard waste area, and the road builder better not, you know, slop out the edges or build it up higher than that, or it will become unsafe and cause landslides in its own right. Now, in the broad sense, side cast pullback is not really very complicated, okay? You scoop. And then you dump it in a truck, and then you go put it someplace safe. So this, this, this is not rocket science. And we get back, we try to get back, you're not always successful, but we try to get back to natural ground. Now you don't have, besides possibly that humus soil layer, a, a really great natural back natural hill slope indicator. These are old growth stones, okay? These were 300 year old trees when this road was first built and those trees first got cut. So when we get back to these old growth stumps, they're, they're huge. These are one and a half to two meter diameter stumps. And they're Douglas fir or western red cedar, which take centuries to rot, right? You get back to those, that's your natural ground. I had this argument a lot with my engineers because they would point to stumps on the fill prism and they'd say, well, they're stumps. And I'd say, yes, and they're second growth stumps. Those trees grew after the fill was put there, not buying it. And second growth stumps are smaller. They may still have the bark on them. So having made abundant mistakes, um, we, we laid out a new road, brand, brand new road, uh, oh, 1,500 meters, maybe out along a steep ridge line. It's one of the first big projects that I really got involved with. We put it out to bid. I was in the manager's office going, I don't approve of this. Oh, we'll only let our three best road contractors even bid on it. Well, they took the low bid, and the low bid was the low bid because those idiots didn't think they'd have to do any drill and shoot into a rocky ridge they had walked along. Um, my engineer's comment after the fact was that the company, neat and clean, was anything but, and the only thing they should be allowed to do is uh, build road on a flat, dry surface. 
Um, but one of the tricks they played was I had sections of road that were supposed to be end hauled, no side cast over the edge, and sections of road where it was okay to side cast. And when I said it's okay to side cast, I was picturing the cut and the fill that would happen along that segment of road. What they did was they took the side cast from other segments of road and loaded it up there. Uh -huh. And so now we're doing side cast pullback of huge mounds on skinny little ridges, right? And so that's where I came up with this side cast adjacent only call. If you're doing new construction, it means you do that cut, you do that fill over the side right there. No extra material comes into that segment. If you're doing a reconstruction, it means the, the little crap from the cut slope and the ditch fill can be put over the side. Okay, so each row, it, when, when I get involved with road and steep ground, whether it's reconstruction or new construction, each segment of road gets an explicit call. You know, we're going to do side casts, pull back. We're specifying no new side cast, but you can leave what's there. Sometimes if you're right on a ridge line, that call specifies to the left or to the right side, because obviously you can side cast off either side of the ridge. Side cast adjacent only, we delineate the waste areas in carefully thought out locations. So you can't see this very well, but this really literally is a piece of road. It says begin betterment, begin no side cast, side cast pull back for about one, about, about 30 meters, get to end the no side cast. This is what a map looks like for the Department of Natural Resources who regulates us and for the road contractor. With very explicit calls all the way along. Um, other good practices in steep ground are to oversize the stream crossing pipes because of the sediment that's going to be passing through limit ditch water accumulation by placing relief pipes, cross drains, um, close together, but also real careful locations. I make all of the water decisions in this kind of ground. Um, all the pipes should be on a good gradient, and of course, if you're putting in a stream crossing, you're compacting the fill or building it out of rock. So this is an example of a, a careful um, we're in some kind of a concave feature that's filled with soil right here. And you see we've got rock here on the ridge. Now, road builders are trying to make a road with less tight curves, so invariably in the old roads there's more side cast here because they were trying to straighten the road out. And then they're probably right where it was real nice and stable to begin with on a ridge nose. There probably isn't much side cast at all. But this is a good cross drain location. I've got road grade. I have controlled the water through the dangerous feature. I'm digging a cross drain in where I've still got some soil on the edge to dig it into. So I'm not trying to dig it into the rock, right? and then it's on a strong skew and then a flume or a downspout so the water is coming out on this, the edge of this ridge and not in the feature that I expect to fail. Pipe should be on a good gradient. We were talking about that yesterday. I like cross drains on at least 5% everywhere on the landscape. Um, but we go a lot steeper than that for small stream crossings up in real steep places. We'll, we'll put a pipe in on 45%. Um, reconstruction, obviously, if you have some existing road prism, it's cheaper than starting over. My experience with the last generation of engineers, and those were men who engineered railroad grades before they got into this ground and started building truck roads, they did what they could. We have worked incredibly hard sometimes to avoid 300 meters of 20% road that was truck assist. Oh, there's got to be a better way to do this. We're going to engineer here, engineer there, run P lines. I mean, we got so much tape 
hung on trees running pea line around the landscape. It's incredible. And you know what? Usually we don't make it. Usually those men in the 30s and 40s had already tried everything. They did what they had to do to make, make a truck road at all. I will also say this, that with very limited exception, there's a win-win, okay? The cheapest road is also the safest road from an environmental standpoint. It just meant that you worked pretty hard. You tried some different P lines. You came back and played with those P lines in road inch. But with rare exception, the less dirt you move, the less environmental risk you incurred. And the less dirt you moved, the less it cost to build the road. So this is where really careful engineering pays off. And my engineers will try four different attempts in some of this ground, and I will walk four different attempts with them, and we'll run road inch and try different permutations before we land on sort of the best possible scenario. Another thing that factors into that scenario, and sometimes, um, sometimes we incur a little more environmental risk because of it, is logger safety. Loggers have to be able to operate, the log trucks have to be able to go up and down the road and not be scared to death. So there's times when I'd rather build on a 90% planar slope with no delivery to the river rather than going through a couple of 70% bedrock hollows and the engineers have you know, talked me off the ledge and convinced me that there's a logger safety issue and that we need to incur a little more environmental risk. Um, and, and here again, you get into road inch. Um, there's ways to reduce the mass haul. Road inch is going to tell you, okay, you've got these cuts. Here's what you want to end haul rather than throwing over the side. What are you going to have to put in a truck and haul away? I had an older road engineer retired about three years ago out of the Forks office. It's kind of an unusual forest engineer. His master's was actually in civil engineering. He did the, like the big bridge design. Um, he could walk a piece of old road that had already had all of this effort surrounding it, my effort, the junior engineer's efforts, road inch, everything. He could walk a piece of road in three hours, tweak a few things, and all of a sudden the road inch number went from 8,000 cubic yards to 5,500 cubic yards. I saw him do this repeatedly. He had an eye for understanding the three-dimensional implications of these decisions like no one else I've ever seen. And I've always regretted that he was in such an isolated office position because the young engineers coming into Rainier didn't get much exposure to him. Um, but uh, some of the tricks were, if you're rebuilding a stream crossing and you're cranking it way upstream and, and way out of the stream, trying for a smaller pipe, that makes a really tight corner. It, it's limiting the amount of material, it's, 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 it's shallowing the stream crossing, so if a debris flow comes down you don't have much material there, that's usually a good thing when stuff's super steep. Um, but if you pull that crossing downstream and make a gentler corner, it's more likely that you're going to be able to use a low boy to get your tower or your uh, swing yarder transported in and it doesn't have to walk itself up the hill. It's a better curve for the log truck drivers. And you purposely install a deeper stream crossing, particularly in places where if you can find a little nick point with a lower channel gradient, you've got evidence that the last debris flow was starting to deposit material on the sides of the channel. You may actually stop the next debris flow and that taller stream crossing was material you didn't haul down the hill, right? So it's a waste area that doesn't look like a waste area. Um, you can break rocky cut slopes that are quality material down and it just add to the ballast on the road. We leave a lot of material up there, not over the side, on top of the road. The whole road grade just came up meter, meter and a half 
everywhere. That requires slack grade, right? You're, you're not running 18% favorable haul to get from the valley bottom to the top of the ridge and doing that the whole way up the hill. You're doing it when the grade slacks out. But it's a, it's a great technique. So ballast you're referring to, is it like a subgrade, I guess? Yeah, so, subgrade. We, we call that big blocky stuff ballast, and then you put a running surface on top of it. Metal. Yeah, we just call it crushed rock, but I, I love that metal word. Okay, so this would be an example of an oversized stream crossing that we did on purpose. Um, there's actually, this is sort of the apex of a debris fan right in this area. That's what this surface is. So the last debris flow under natural conditions when the road wasn't here was starting to deposit at this point. That's really good news because that means we're at a gradient where we can stop the next one. This stream crossing was originally designed quite a ways up valley. We pulled it down. This is mm, maybe about five meters high. We've got a five foot pipe here that you can't really see because of the mess in the way. And then this is actually an overflow. It's functioning as a cross drain, but it's also going to function as an overflow for the big pipe if something comes down and blocks the big pipe. And then you build a stream crossing like that, a lot of it will just be rock. So they're pretty hard to move anyway. This would be an example of extra ballast from the cut slope. And this took me a while to understand. We had a really excellent road builder that started doing this. His name was Ray Winnie. He actually was a professional engineer with a license. He just liked operating the excavator and he did that until he was 74 years old. And then he started designing fish pipes for us. Um, so you see these stumps here, meter or two below the edge of the road. And then I would come out and view this like, gee, don't we have side casts there? Well, not really. It's actually the, the crap has been pulled back. And then the whole road grade has been built up out of the rocky stuff that came out of the cut slope instead of putting it in a truck and hauling it a kilometer down the hill at some horrendous cost. Now, you can't do this with junk, right? If you're cutting into clay, you can't play this game. You've got to be in a competent lithology. I have seen a road builder with tiny little pieces of side cast adjacent only, so we're basically in a gully going up valley in a fairly steep gully. There's some tiny little ridges. I've approved a tiny little bit of side cast. I've seen a good road builder use those for wood. All the dirt went down the hill and he used those places I gave him to stack wood, which was really clever because wood doesn't fit in those dump trucks very well, right? You don't smash it in very well, and so you end up running your dump truck up and down the hill a lot without much weight in it. Okay, log decks. You've already heard about my beef with log decks. Right, so this is, uh, I don't know, 100, 110% slope in a gully, and that is a pretty good sized log deck against one crappy little alder tree. Huh, what's wrong with this picture? And there are times I find stuff like this in new road construction jobs. Oh, we're going to go out and pick up that wood, and I'm like, yeah, and that's going to be right now. I'll, I'll be on the phone while I'm standing here if I have cell phone coverage. <laughs> like, what were you thinking? Um, so generally we don't do that anymore, but even a decade ago I still found some of these. This one's a little bit better. There's at least two or three conifer trees and the hill slope isn't as steep and at least they didn't like, you know, damage the end of the pipe. That's always a good thing. Uh, this is more in the realm of logging technique, but we use sort of pilings, sometimes actually These weren't trees here. These were logs that got cut and then got pounded in. And you can use this during the logging operation to brace a log deck. And so when you're doing all the sorts around the landing in steep ground, sometimes this is a great way to hang on to some of your sorts. Cut slope failures are a reality. I don't care that much about them. Most of them don't cause problems. Most of them don't deliver. Very few of them are big enough to run across the road and keep going, right? 
but they are a reality and they can be kind of dangerous. Um, usually about two winters. Road, road goes through about two winters with some cut slope failures. You just keep picking them up and getting your ditches reopened and, and then eventually um, things stabilize. You do have to think about safety related to cut slope failures. I've been a few places where the operator is at a lot of risk. I can think of a place where there's a the fracture system in the sandstone is very, very big and one of the fractured planes is coming right down at the road. So blocks the size of refrigerators have punched out of that cut slope, driven through the lower road, landed in the river. I went back to the office finding one of these one day and I said, I don't know how you're going to do this and this and that, but here's where you're never going to rebuild the old road because we could have gotten an excavator operator killed. As it is, we've had a couple of good accidents. We had a young guy running an excavator, chewing into a high, failing cut slope. He took a rock through the front cab of his windshield, yay big, landed in his lap. He was able to wiggle his legs out and go out the back window of the cab relatively unhurt. I mean, a little bruised, but nothing was broken. It could have been a lot worse than that. So these are considerations when you're building these roads and looking at the materials along the edge. It's also why, although you can do reconstruction in, in, in quality rock, you can do reconstructions in the middle of winter, but you got to be careful with the cut slope aspects. So this is exactly where the risk is. I was wishing Simon was here. Um, I can show you some of these later. This is this bedrock hollow landform, the concave thing. It's fundamentally formed by repeated landslides. It's where we expect the next slide landslides naturally, and it's where roads are most likely to have impacts. Although, because of the side cast and because of water concentration, roads can drive landslides where we don't naturally expect them. So this is real common. I've got rock here, I've got rock here, and I've got a wedge of dirt in the middle. Because this one's starting to form a little channel, I have to put a pipe here. But I don't have to let very much other water come here. We've probably got a cross drain just up here to limit the amount of water that we're focusing into this system. <clears throat> so you don't add extra ballast. I mean, think about that, is that, that even the part of your road right there in that curve that's full benched is, quote, full benched, because it's in a bedrock hollow, it's full benched into soil, right? not full benched into rock like the rest of this road is. So that's not where you play the ballast game. It's probably the single most important place to do pullback and we limit water to these places. Because a lot of road failures you go out and there's, there's a big amount of fill, there's a log deck, there's slash, and there's some kind of a water problem. I, I think of roads as like a big stick driving driving failures. Uh, hang on here a minute. There's one more slide I wanted to show you. Click to exit. Click what? Escape? Exit? There we go. Okay. Yeah, I had one more slide I found. Um, sometimes we've found partners in these projects. So this is a lower Columbia group that does a lot of restoration. We've developed quite a relationship with them over the years. This was back in 2012 and a, a slide out of a presentation I did for them. So they supported, they paid part of the cost. We got the rest of the cost from the state government. Um, actually, Rainier's financial contribution was my time up front. These 
And you can kind of see we're in variable landscape. There's some broader sort of moderate gradient areas, right? And then there's some areas with real tight contours and steep roads. But these little red things, okay, we're going to pull back this whole landing. And that landing, and that landing. And this piece of road that's right along the lower river. And this whole big headwall area. But if you look at the total length of road, and you look at careful choices for sidecast pullback, these are the places, they're the steepest, they're concave, they route to the water system. It doesn't add up to that much. Sidecast pullback doesn't actually cost that much until you're doing reconstruction and pushing into the cut slip, right? You feel like I got another minute or two, I can draw, draw another picture. Um, okay, pulling this back and taking it away doesn't actually cost that much, even when it's, you know, four to six cubic yards per lineal yard. If you've still got your drivable road prism when you get done with that process, this wasn't super expensive. Where it gets expensive is when you push center line into that cut slope four feet. And all of a sudden, the mass haul from that segment of road tripled or quadrupled. That's when this gets expensive. The other thing, okay. Um, last two messages. You've got this side cast prism out here. I want it laid back typically to about 67%, which is kind of natural angle of repose. In a lot of cases, there'll be like a little bump down here that shows you where the bottom of most of the remaining fill is. Might be down 20, uh, uh, seven to 10 meters. There'll be cracking up here, showing you that it's unstable, it's starting to open up. And if you connect the dots and get 67% from here, you actually intersect those cracks. One of my engineers was really, really startled. I, I was the one down here clinging to bushes. He was up here, I couldn't see his feet. I'm shooting my clino on him and backing him up and forward until I get to 67%. And what we're actually doing in the earliest days is trying to flag out the, the side cast prism so an operator has a better idea what they're doing. And again and again and again, I'm putting his boot heel in the cracks. Um, and what you don't want, you, you want this to be gentle. You want this pull back to be almost like a gentle little curve, slightly convex out, right? What you don't want to do is take a real serious bite. You actually want to do a little less as opposed to being real aggressive and doing a little more because when you do this bite, you end up with a little place to pond water. So I've had operators do this, and I've gone, man, you actually took out more than you needed to, and you've left this ponding place, which is now, you know, because that's probably as far as they could reach. It's, it's hard to fix. Um, and then also, if you've got a piece of road and you're doing pullback, you don't want to make it look like that, and then you've left a steep side edge. Very first time I sent somebody out to pull back a piece that was cracking open, that's exactly what they did. You want this pullback to be sort of feathered out, away from you. Um, and you, if you're designing this kind of stuff, you want to talk to the operator. All these situations, whether it's Rainier, whether it's some of the science projects I work on, I've got three, four people between me and the excavator operator. That never goes well. I ask for some sp pretty special water management. Doesn't all get translated. 
I specify what this looks like doesn't get transmitted the first time an operator does sidecast pullback for us. I'm out there, I'm drawing pictures on the side of his dirty excavator like this. It's a 10 minute conversation means that guy didn't do three weeks of mediocre work. I do not like people in between me and the excavator guy. <coughs> Any questions? Are you all ready to rush out and do some of this? Uh, why would you uh, pull back sidecast instead of just putting it straight into a, a truck we 